Hello and welcome to my Edexcel Combined Science Basics presentation on uh, for Biology Paper 1. This contains only basic information. It is not intended to get you a grade 9, but it should be able to get you a grade 5. Make sure that you do not just listen to this presentation. Make sure that you are taking notes, pause it, rewind it to go over bits that didn't make sense. Make mind maps, draw diagrams, answer practice exam questions. Make sure you're doing anything that requires thought because when you think hard, you learn. Let's start with topic one key concepts, which is about the structure of cells, uh, including specialized cells, microscopes, enzymes, and cell transport. Cells the basic structural unit of all living organisms. So all living things are made of cells. And um, we've got animal cells and plant cells, and they both contain these things here. So they both contain cytoplasm, nucleus, ribosome, mitochondria, and cell membrane. And plant cells also contain chloroplasts, vacuole, and a cell wall. So in terms of what some of those things do, we call each one of those parts of a cell an organelle, okay? Um, the nucleus contains DNA and it controls the cell. The cell membrane controls what enters and leaves the cell. The cytoplasm is where chemical reactions inside the cell happen. Ribosomes make proteins. Mitochondria are where aerobic respiration takes place and that releases energy. And then chloroplasts contain chlorophyll and that's where photosynthesis happens. Not all cells are the same. so. We call the different kinds of animal cell, different kinds of plant cell called specialized cells. And these are cells adapted for a specific role with features that are called adaptations. Okay. Two particular ones we're going to focus on. We've got the sperm cell and the egg cell. Now sperm cells, they've got this great big long tail to help them swim. They've got this section here packed with lots of mitochondria to give them energy to swim. They've got this haploid nucleus with only half the normal amount of DNA, so 23 single chromosomes. And they've got an acrosome here to help them digest their way into the egg. The egg, again, it has this haploid nucleus with only half the normal DNA. It's got a thick jelly coat. Okay, And the jelly coat hardens when the first sperm cell penetrates it so that only one sperm cell can enter. Um, and it has lots of mitochondria and lots of nutrients to give it energy to grow. There are lots of other specialized cells, including ciliated cells, red blood cells, nerve cells, xylem cells, and root hair cells. Bacterial cells are slightly different to animal and plant cells. So they've got some common features. So they've still got a cell membrane. They've still got cytoplasm. They've still got ribosomes, albeit slightly smaller ones. And they also have a cell wall like plant cells, but it's got a slightly different um, structure. They may also have a tail called a flagellum, but not all bacteria have those and that helps them move. Um, and the big difference is they don't have a nucleus. Instead, they have DNA in two chunks. So they've got this, this bit here, this bit here called the chromosomal DNA, uh, which contains most of the genes. And they have these small chunks of DNA like here called plasmids and they uh, they get swapped between bacteria to uh, help spread genes from one to another. We know so much about cells from microscopes. Microscopes produce magnified images and magnification is how many times bigger an object appears than it really is. Microscopes work using two lenses, the objective lenses, which are mentioned uh, here. And you normally have three of those. So there might be times four, times 10, and times 40 magnification and we also have the eyepiece lens which is normally times 10. This gives an overall magnification by multiplying the objective lens by the eyepiece lens. Other important parts of the microscope we've also got the coarse and fine adjustment dials for focusing it and we've got the stage where you place the slides. Microscopes produce pictures called micrographs. This here is a micrograph. Um, this one has a magnification of 4,000 times. You need to be able to use a micrograph to find the actual size of parts of a cell. And we're going to use this equation. And it's super easy. If we wanted to find the actual diameter of the nucleus here, we would measure it with a ruler. And let's say that was 20 millimeters. We would just do measured size, 20, divided by magnification, 4,000, which would equal 0 0.005 
millimeters. We might want to times that by a thousand to convert it into micrometers. So that would come to five micrometers. You need to be comfortable with numbers presented in standard form, which is a way of presenting very large or very small numbers in terms of powers of 10 like this. So something times 10 to the power of something. The power of 10 with a positive power. So here we've got a positive power six. That is the number of places that appear after the decimal point. So to turn this into a quote unquote normal number, okay, that two is the first number we write, okay? And then you'll notice there are six places after that two. So we go five, four, because we've got five, four over here, okay? And then fill the rest of that up with zeros, okay? Numbers smaller than one can be represented with negative powers of 10. So again, similar kind of thing, but now the power of 10 represents the position in which the decimal starts. So here, because it's 10 to the minus six, we're gonna have this number here starting on the sixth decimal place. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So the two is the sixth decimal place, and then we just finish off the rest of the number here. Now your first core practical was to use microscopes. So the first thing is you place your sample on a slide, one of those little oblongs of glass. Next, you stain it with something like iodine to show up the features. You place a little glass square over it called a cover slip, which protects it. Then we place the slide on the stage. This here is the stage. We select our objective lens, either four, 10 or 40 times. We use the rough focus knob to get a, uh, a rough picture. And then finally, we use the fine focus to get a clear, crisp picture. Enzymes are proteins that are found in all of our cells and they speed up chemical reactions. Enzymes work on chemicals called a substrate, so the substrate gets changed in some way by the enzyme. Now, on every enzyme, there is an area called an active site. The active site is part of the enzyme that has the same shape as the substrate. Enzymes work by the lock and key mechanism. So the idea is that the substrate enters the enzyme and it forms an enzyme substrate complex. Whilst it is in the active site, the substrate changes in some way to form the products. And then the products leave the active site and the active site is left unchanged, ready for another substrate to go in. And this process is repeated many thousands of times every second. One particular type of enzymes is called digestive enzymes and their job is to break down large food molecules into ones that are small enough to be absorbed into our blood in our intestines. There are three main types. First one we have are called lipase enzymes. Their job is to break down fat molecules into glycerol and fatty acids and that takes place in the small intestine. Then we have protease enzymes. Their job is to break down proteins into uh, amino acids. And that happens both in the stomach with one called uh, pepsin and in the small intestine with a different one called trypsin. And lastly, we have amylase. Its job is to break down starch uh, into simple sugars. And that first of all starts in our saliva and then it continues again uh, in our small intestines. All enzymes can be denatured. That means the active site changes shape and the enzyme stops working. So here you can see a normal enzyme with the active site having a shape that matches the substrate. A denatured enzyme like this one, you can see the active site has completely changed shape and it doesn't fit the substrate anymore. This can be caused by high temperatures and very high or very low pHs. We did a core practical to investigate how the pH affects the rate that an enzyme works. The enzyme we used was amylase and it digests starch solution. Now to do this, what we did was we had a dropping tile, that's this thing here, which has lots of little wells in it, and in each well, there is a small amount of iodine. Now the key here is that iodine turns black in the presence of starch. So to set this up, we got one test tube of starch solution and another test tube containing amylase and a pH buffer. The buffer is a solution with a specific pH. And we put both test tubes into a water bath at 40 degrees Celsius to reach the optimum temperature. Then we mixed the test tubes and started a timer. 
and every 30 seconds we took a sample out of the test tube and put it into one of our little wells of iodine on the dropping tile. And if it went black, we continued the experiment. And if it didn't go black, if it stayed this sort of orangey brown colour, that meant that all the starch had been used up and we could stop the timer. What we did then was we repeated it with different pH buffers at a range of different pHs. And what you can do is you can compare the times for each of the different pHs. And the longer the time, the slower the rate and vice versa. And what we found was that if we did this, we got a graph like this. So it sort of dips like that. So if that is um, pH and that is time, we found that there in the middle, it had the lowest time. And as you got to a lower pH or a higher pH, the time increased because the rate had decreased. We need to understand how substances enter and leave cells. And in order to do that, we need to understand the concept of concentration. Concentration is the number of particles in a given volume. And we all sort of understand this from our experience of making up Ribena. If we look at these drinks here, we can see that this Ribena has a much lower concentration than this one. If you think about making this, this first Ribena might have just a tiny amount of Ribena and a whole great load of water, whereas this one might have an awful lot of Ribena in it and very little water. Now, to put that a bit more formally, if we think about actual numbers of particles, if we look at this first diagram here, you can see the red has a lower concentration than the blue because there's fewer reds than blues. If we look at the second diagram, we can see that the red and blue now have equal concentrations because there are equal numbers of each one, there's 10 of each. If we look at these, this is a little more complicated because here we've got seven green particles in each of these pistons. But the one on the right here, this is most concentrated because although the number of particles is same, the volume is smaller. And so the overall concentration is greater because it's about the number of particles in a given volume. Now, the first way that substances move in and out of cells is diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of substances from high concentration to low concentration. We describe that as being down a concentration gradient. And you can see that happening in this little animation here. The green particles start off at a high concentration in the bottle and they move away from the bottle towards a low concentration. This is how substances move into the lungs, so how oxygen goes from the lungs to the blood and how carbon dioxide goes from the blood to the lungs. Equally, carbon dioxide enters a leaf from the air where there's a high concentration into the leaf where there's low concentration. And oxygen leaves a leaf by the same process of diffusion. There's a high oxygen concentration in a leaf and it leaves the leaf to the air where there's a lower oxygen concentration. Osmosis is how water moves in and out of cells and it is the diffusion of water across a partially permeable membrane. A partially permeable membrane for example, a cell membrane is a membrane that has small holes in it that allow some substances to pass through, but not others. So in this example, water can pass through, that's the blue particles, but these green particles of sugar cannot pass through. So what happens is water diffuses, in this case, from the left hand side, where there is a high concentration of water to the right hand side where there is a low concentration of water. How do you know the concentration of water? Well, you've got to think about the amount of solute that is dissolved in it. The more solute, so sugar or salt or something that is dissolved in the water, the lower the water concentration is because there's a load of sugar and other stuff taking up the space. So water moves from where there is a small amount of solute to where there is a large amount of solute because that is going from where there's a large amount of water to where there is a small amount of water. The final type of transport is called active transport, and this moves substances from low concentration to high concentration. So we describe that as being up a concentration gradient. This is, for example, how minerals from the soil move into a root hair cell. It's also how sucrose moves into a sieve cell in the stem of a plant. You can see an example of active transport happening here. So there are these proteins in the membranes of cells. And what happens is that they grab the uh, 
the substances from the low concentration side and spit them out on the high concentration side. This requires energy, which is why we call it active transport. So cells that do a lot of active transport will have a lot of mitochondria to provide them the energy to do so. The core practical on this was to do with the osmosis uh, in potato chips. So what we did here was we cut potato chips of similar sizes. Okay? We blotted them dry and we recorded the mass. Then we placed them in sucrose. Now sucrose is just sugar. So sugar solutions of different concentrations. And we left them for 15 minutes. Then we blotted them dry and we reweighed them. And we calculated the percentage change using this formula. Okay, So percentage change equals final minus initial divided by initial times 100. And what we found was that the potato chips that were in a weak sugar solution swelled up because what happened was there was a higher concentration of water in the sugar solution and a lower concentration of water inside the potato. So by osmosis, water went from the solution into the potato and the potato cells got bigger. And so the, the, uh, the mass increased. In the really strong sugar solution, the concentration of water in the potato chip was higher than it was in the solution. So water left the potato chip by osmosis and entered the solution. So the potato chips in the strong solutions got physically smaller and lost mass. And somewhere in the middle, you have, you have potato chips that didn't change mass because the concentration of water inside and outside the chip was the same. Now, on to topic two cells and control. So this is about cell division, mitosis, uh, a little bit about meiosis and also about the nervous system. So cell division is the process of making two cells. And we talk about two types of cell. We talk about diploid cells and haploid cells. Now diploid cells are your normal body cells. Nearly every single cell in your body is diploid. That means it contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, so 46 in total. Haploid cells, on the other hand, are your gametes. So gentlemen, that's your sperm, and ladies, that is your eggs. Now these have 23 single chromosomes, so only 23 chromosomes in total. The idea being that when sperm meets egg, the two sets of 23 chromosomes pair up to make 46 total. Mitosis is the process of cell division that is used to make diploid cells. So nearly every cell in your body is made by mitosis, except for your gametes. So in mitosis, one diploid parent cell makes two genetically identical daughter cells. And we need to understand the, uh, the different stages of this process. So before mitosis, you have this process here called interphase. Now during interphase, this is the day-to-day -day life of the cell. Um, it is replicating DNA, it's making extra cell parts to get ready for mitosis. You know, respiration is happening, it's just the normal day-to-day -day life of the cell. But when it's ready, mitosis itself begins, and it's made of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. Now, during prophase, what happens is the nucleus breaks down, and you can see the chromosomes here are now uh, you know, outside the nucleus, and we've got these two little starfish-looking things that are called spindle fibres, and they're starting to form. Now, metaphase, the spindle fibres are fully formed. You can see they reach from one end of the cell to the other. And you can see the chromosomes have lined up along those spindle fibres. And importantly, these chromosomes you'll see are not singular, but they're actually in pairs. That's why they look X-shaped, because they're clipped together in the middle. Now, during anaphase, what happens is those pairs separate out. You can see these chromosomes aren't, aren't um, X-shaped anymore. And what they do is they move down the spindle fibres to each end of the cell. And that leaves us to telophase. Now, during telophase, now the chromosomes are at each end of the cell. A new nucleus forms around each one. And also, you can see the cell starts to pinch in at the middle because it's starting to separate. And that separation is completed during cytokinesis. Now, you can see we have two entirely separate cells, which are genetically identical to the parent cell they started from. Meiosis, on the other hand, is used to make only your gametes. So only your sperm cells, chaps, and your egg cells, ladies, are produced by meiosis. 
in meiosis, one diploid parent cell makes four genetically different haploid daughter cells. And as I said, this only makes gametes. So this starts in a similar way to mitosis. So you have some DNA replication at the beginning and you start with a diploid cell that makes two diploid daughters. However, what happens then is that each of those diploid daughters splits again into a cell without first replicating its DNA. So that ends up making a total of four haploid daughter cells. Now, the reason they need to be haploid is because of fertilization. So fertilization is when a sperm fuses with an egg to make a zygote. Okay? Now the zygote is the first cell of you and you know that half of your DNA came from your mother and half your DNA came from your father and that takes place during fertilization when the 23 chromosomes in the haploid sperm cell from your father fuse with the 23 chromosomes from the haploid egg cell from your mother and that makes a zygote. The zygote then starts dividing again by mitosis this time not meiosis by mitosis um, to form a ball of cells called an embryo and eventually that embryo if uh, if everything goes to plan will turn into a fetus the fetus will become a baby and the baby will become a whole new human. Stem cells are a type of cell that when they divide they can differentiate. Differentiation is when a cell divides to produce two different types of specialized cell. So cells that can do this are called stem cells. So when a stem cell differentiates, it means that it divides into two new cells and they're not gonna necessarily be the same. So it might be a stem cell and a blood cell. It might be a blood cell and a nerve cell or whatever it is. And you can see that whole process sort of summarized on this diagram where the stem cells in the middle are turning into all these different other kinds of cell that you can see. There are different types of stem cells, so embryonic ones that you've had when you're a developing embryo, they're the best ones, they can become any kind of cell in the body. You've still got some stem cells in you now called adult stem cells, but they're less flexible. So you've got different kinds, like a blood stem cell can make all your blood cells, but couldn't make a nerve cell, for example. This whole process is really important because we started out as one single type of cell, and it's only by differentiation that we can make all the different kinds of cell that we have in us now. In order to be able to respond quickly to things happening in the world around you, your body relies on the nervous system. Now your nervous system is all of your nerves working together to gather information and to make decisions. Now your nervous system carries electrical messages around the body, which are called impulses. And it is made up of nerve cells called neurons. Okay? Now a nerve cell, this neuron, has a cell body in the middle and it has a dendron and an axon. The dendron carries an impulse towards the cell body and the axon carries it away from the cell body. Okay? There are different types of neurons. So there are sensory neurons which carry sense impulses from our sense receptors towards the central nervous system, which is our brain and spinal cord. We have relay neurons which are in the central nervous system and their job is to make decisions. And then we have motor neurons, which carry impulses from the central nervous system back down to things like muscles in order to carry out an action. Neurons carry uh, nerve impulses in the form of an electrical signal that passes along the axon and the dendron of the neuron. However, to go from one nerve cell to another is a problem because there's a small gap between the two nerve cells called a synapse and the electrical impulse cannot travel across that synapse. So instead what happens is the uh, message travels across that in the form of these chemicals called neurotransmitters. Now at the end of the axon is something called an axon terminal, that's that word there, okay? And in that axon terminal are these little pockets of neurotransmitter and they get released and they diffuse across the gap to the dendron of the, or actually specifically the dendrite of the neighboring nerve cell. And once the dendrite picks up those neurotransmitters, it starts a new impulse, which goes again in the form of electricity along the next nerve cell. Now, the reflex arc is a process by which uh, nerve impulses can be processed very, very quickly to save us from dangerous situations. That's what a reflex is. 
and it works something like this. So it starts with a stimulus. The stimulus might be some source of danger, like a, like a touching a hot flame. Now, that is detected by sense receptors in the finger, and they pass a impulse all the way up a sensory neuron to the central nervous system. In this case, it's the spinal cord, which is the bundle of nerves running down your backbone. The relay neurons in the central nervous system make a decision. The decision is, move the arm, we're in danger, chaps. And so they send another message back down a motor neuron to the muscle. And the, that tells the muscle to twitch and pull the arm away. And what this process does is it allows an action to happen very, very quickly in order to keep us safe without us having to spend conscious thought in it. Voluntary actions, you know, reaching to pick up a glass to have a drink or something, they take place in a similar way, but the impulses don't just go to the spinal cord, but go all the way to the brain and the brain makes a conscious decision. Topic three, genetics. This covers the structure of DNA and the idea of alleles. So the structure of DNA, first of all, we have in our cells not one big DNA molecule, but 46 smaller DNA molecules called chromosomes, which contain DNA wrapped around proteins. Now, a gene is a section of DNA that is the code for a single protein. Our DNA contains about 20,000 different genes, which means we make about 20,000 different proteins. In terms of the structure of DNA itself, there are a few things to know about it. It has this double helix structure. That means it's like a twisted ladder. It has complementary base pairs. So C and G always pair together and A and T always pair together. To remember that, look at the shapes of the letters. C and G are both curvy and they stick together. And A and T are both made of straight lines and they stick together. And you can see that base pairing here. Okay. The DNA has a sugar phosphate backbone. So the straight part of the ladder there is made of this alternating sequence of sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And you can see the bases are attached to the sugar, not the phosphate. And the last thing is between the bases. So in that section there, between the bases are weak hydrogen bonds that can be unzipped uh, in order to allow the DNA to work properly. Our genes come in different versions called alleles, and an allele can be dominant or recessive. A dominant allele means we only need one copy of it to show that feature, whereas a recessive one, we need two copies of it to show the feature. Because we have two genes for each characteristic, because we get one from our mother, one from our father, we can either be homozygous or heterozygous for a gene. Homozygous means we've got two of the same allele, and heterozygous means we've got two different alleles. And the final thing is that we talk about our genotype and our phenotype. Genotype is the genes that we have, and phenotype is the characteristics or the features that that leads to. So if you think about eye colour, okay, the eye colour gene comes in two alleles. The capital B is the dominant one for brown eyes, and the lowercase b is the recessive one for blue eyes. And there's a few possible combinations. So this person is homozygous dominant and has brown eyes because they've got a copy of the brown eye gene. The second person is heterozygous with two different alleles, but still has brown eyes. So the phenotype is still brown because they've got one copy of the dominant brown eye gene. The genotype of this final person is homozygous because they're the same, recessive because they're both recessive lowercase ones. And that leads to the phenotype blue, because blue being recessive means you need to have two copies of it to show the characteristic. Now, our genes are inherited from our parents. So each parent gives us one allele of each gene. And we can understand this using something called a Punnett square. Now, Punnett square is used to predict the sort of likelihood of different offspring based on knowing the genotype of the parents. So um, if we look at this first example, so these two bits are showing the genotype of the male. So this is a heterozygous male. Now, if you think about the heterozygous male, because his sperms are haploid, so they contain one of each chromosome, that means half of his sperms are going to be dominant gene uh, for eye colour, and the other half are going to be the recessive gene. And likewise with a female, half of her eggs are going to be 
dominant, half of them recessive. And so this bit here just shows the different possible combinations of offspring from that couple. Um, a quarter of them would have be homozygous dominant, um, a quarter of them would be homozygous recessive, and half of them would be heterozygous. For a different couple now, so this is a, a male who is homozygous recessive to lowercase b's, okay? and again the same female, so it's heterozygous. Now we've got a different combination of possibilities. So half of them are going to be heterozygous, and half of them are going to be homozygous recessive, which means there's half of them are likely to have blue eyes. This only shows probability, not what will definitely happen. Variation is the differences between uh, members of a species and affects your chances of survival. So we know that no two people are the same. Those differences are important. There are two types of variation, discontinuous and continuous. So discontinuous variation is variation that can only be one thing or another. The best way to think about this is the, uh, the example of blood group. So your blood can be type A, type B, type AB, or O, but it can't be somewhere in between. It can't be sort of A and a half or B.3. Discontinuous variation is only caused by your genes. So your genes cause your blood color, your uh, blood type rather. There is nothing you can do to change it. Continuous variation, however, is caused by a combination of genes and the environment. And this is variation that can be any number within a range. So if you think about height, you, you know, the shortest people might be somewhere around a meter tall and the tallest people somewhere around two and a half meters tall. And you can have people that are anywhere in that range. And we can see that on a graph here, this is uh, for height. And you can see that this continuous variation, you get more people of an average height in the middle, okay? And fewer people on each side. And so you get this kind of, what's called a bell curve or a normal distribution. Continuous variation is affected by both genes and the environment. So, for example, if you've got uh, two tall parents, it's likely that you will also be tall, but not definite. Because if you had two tall parents, but were fed a really poor diet as a child, that poor diet means you wouldn't grow to what your sort of potential is. So continuous variation is affected by both genes and the environment. Discontinuous variation is only from genes. Topic four, natural selection and genetic modification.
one class of non-communicable diseases is called malnutrition. Malnutrition involves getting too much or too little of certain nutrients for in your diet. So the first type is obesity. Obesity is caused by getting too much fat and or carbohydrates in your diet. And the other type are, is called nutrient deficiencies. These are diseases caused by getting too little of specific nutrients in the diet. So this picture here shows quashior core. Quashial core is caused by too little protein. It causes stunted growth, swollen bellies, uh, low energy, etc. It's often seen in starving children. This picture here shows scurvy. Scurvy is a malnutrition disease caused by a lack of vitamin C, it causes swollen and bleeding gums, uh, uh, joint pain and uh, a lack of energy. Here we have rickets. Rickets is caused by either a lack of vitamin D or a lack of calcium, which softens the bones and leads them to curve like this because they can no longer support your weight fully. And finally, we have anemia. Anemia is caused by a lack of iron. Iron is used to carry oxygen around the blood, so it leads to sort of lightheadedness, dizziness, a lack of energy um, and so on. Another non-communicable disease is liver disease caused by alcohol abuse um, and Specifically, we call it cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is a disease in which the liver starts to break down. And if you look at a liver with cirrhosis, it's got this kind of gnarly, warty surface. Uh, and that is a liver that is dying. And the person with that liver will die. If you compare it to a normal, healthy liver, you can really see the problem. The only cure for this is to get a liver transplant, which is unlikely if you're still an alcoholic. Cardiovascular disease is heart disease, and the main risk factor for it is obesity, which means having too much fat. We determine obesity by the body mass index, which is not a good measure, but is the one on this syllabus. And body mass index, BMI, is your mass in kilograms divided by your height squared in metres. Watch out for unit conversions on these questions in the exam. Now, if we look at what is actually causing the cardiovascular disease, um, you have all around the heart, you have these arteries here and here and here, and they supply the oxygen and the nutrients that the heart needs to pump. Now, in someone with cardiovascular disease, okay, if we look here, we can see that inside those arteries, this fatty substance called plaque has started to build up and it is narrowing the artery and it can cause these blockages, these traffic jams, where the blood just can't get through because the plaque is too thick. Now, if that happens, the area of heart downstream from that blood vessel stops getting enough nutrients and oxygen and it can die and stop beating. And that's what a heart attack is. And if the heart attack happens, the heart stops beating. The rest of the body stops getting the oxygen and nutrients it needs and death can happen very quickly. Communicable diseases are caused by pathogens. Pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease. And broadly speaking, there are four types. There are bacteria, protists, fungi, and viruses. Bacteria are single-celled organisms with no nucleus. Protists are single-celled organisms with a nucleus. Fungi are something slightly different, don't worry too much. And a virus is not a cell, so it's not alive, but it's actually a piece of RNA or DNA surrounded by a protein coat. And pathogens can be spread in a few different ways by direct contact, so touching someone who's infected through the air, the airborne route. So someone sneezes, coughs out a spray of little droplets of mucus that contain the pathogen. They can be waterborne, so the pathogen makes its way into some water, you drink the water, you get the disease. They can be spread through bodily fluids. This is particularly the case for sexually transmitted infections, things like HIV, um, chlamydia, gonorrhea and so on. Um, they can be spread by vectors, which are animals that uh, bite you and pass the pathogen directly into your bloodstream. And then there's the oral route, which is essentially eating contaminated food. So some specific examples, um, we have cholera. Cholera is caused by bacteria uh, and it is waterborne. So cholera leads to very severe diarrhea. So if someone does such diarrhea and uh, the bacteria make their way into the water that you drink, you will then get the cholera. Uh, tuberculosis is a lung disease that causes uh, inflamed 
and broken down lungs and it causes you to cough up blood and all sorts of horrible things uh, caused by bacteria and it is airborne so someone with tuberculosis coughs and they spray out a mist of, of droplets of mucus some of which contain the bacteria which can then be breathed in colds and flu are caused by a virus and again they are also airborne spreading in the same way food poisoning tends to be caused by bacteria and that comes from not cooking food well enough so it's uncontaminated food and if it's not cooked properly you don't kill the bacteria or the pathogens and uh, you get infected hemorrhagic fevers the best example best known example of which is ebola are caused by viruses and they are spread predominantly by direct contact but also through bodily fluids as well hiv aids is a virus which is spread through uh, sexual contact and bodily fluids um, and not just sexual contact but also uh, can be spread through uh, blood as well you know things like sharing needles for, for drug users um, an example of a disease in trees is called chalera ash dieback which causes the leaves of ash trees to wilt and you know, it will kill the tree within about a year and a half two years it is spread by a fungus and it is airborne which makes it really difficult to control because you cannot stop the fungal spores from spreading from tree to tree and the last example we need is malaria malaria is caused by a protist uh, malaria leads to very severe fevers and chills. It kills um, a few million people every year. Um, and it is spread by a vector. So a mosquito has the malaria virus, so malaria protist in it. And when it bites you, it passes the protist directly into your bloodstream. With all these pathogens kicking around, our body has evolved a series of physical barriers and chemical defenses to keep us safe from them. Physical barriers and block and trap pathogens and chemical defenses kill pathogens so important physical barriers in our nose we have uh, mucus and cilia mucus is a thick sticky liquid that traps bacteria and cilia are little hairs that sweep the bacteria the uh, mucus up and out of our lungs and up and out of our throat so it can be coughed up uh, or swallowed um, our skin is an important physical barrier um, it physically stops uh, pathogens from passing through it um, in terms of chemical defenses we've got a couple of important ones one is an enzyme called lysozyme down here that is found in tears and saliva and mucus and it destroys quite a lot of different types of bacteria uh, and also in our stomach we have hydrochloric acid um, which kills most of the pathogens on the food that we eat despite our physical barriers and chemical defenses sometimes pathogens will make it into the body and it is the job of the immune system to destroy them when they do so they kill or destroy pathogens don't just say they fight them that's that's a bit weak and lily livered um, they destroy pathogens through something called the immune response now the immune response works as follows on the surface of every pathogen are chemicals with certain shapes chemical markers with specific shapes called antigens now our body produces types of proteins called antibodies and antibodies have specific shapes that can match the antigens and the idea is that the antibody with the shape that matches an antigen will stick to it and that will end up killing the antigen okay now the immune response is coordinated by a type of white blood cell called a lymphocyte okay now a lymphocyte it produces antibodies and when we first get infected there might only be one lymphocyte that produces the right antibodies for the pathogen but what happens is those antibodies are stuck to the surface of the lymphocyte and when it first meets um, a pathogen that pathogen with the matching antigens will stick to the antibody like this okay so you can see here that the pathogen has stuck to the antibodies on the lymphocyte now that activates the lymphocyte and this phrase activation means that the lymphocyte kind of goes into overdrive and it starts making hundreds and thousands and millions of copies of itself and those lymphocytes then start producing huge amounts of these antibodies and they will flood our body with antibodies and destroy all of the pathogens most of those lymphocytes will then die but a few will remain in our body as what are called memory lymphocytes okay those memory lymphocytes will just remain in our immune system so that the next time you meet the same pathogen we already have enough of the 
right lymphocytes to quickly make enough antibodies to destroy the pathogen before a disease happens. Well done for getting this far. You have reached the end of this presentation. As I said right at the very beginning, make sure that listening isn't all you're doing. You must do stuff that makes you think because when you think, you learn. Thank you and goodbye.